Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us for this thematic webinar on School Education Gateway. School Education Gateway is an initiative of the European Union and is a place to engage with European policy and practice for school education. In this webinar, we will first learn about uh, climate change education through the experience of the nonprofit Italian Climate Network and its activities with schools, including challenges and opportunities when talking about climate change and related issues in classrooms. For this, it is with us today Chiara Soletti, the Human Rights and Climate Policy Advisor for uh, Italian Climate Network. Chiara advocates for the introduction of a gender perspective in the Paris Agreement implementation, and she currently lives in London, where she also works for the Climate Kick as Regional Innovation Scheme Project Officer. The second presentation will uh, emphasize what will uh, what that uh, with a changing rhetoric and attitude towards the climate crisis, this is important for all teachers to reflect on and update their teaching practice. You will learn about an innovative collection of teaching resources, the story of their creation, and how teachers can better address climate breakdown with Paul Turner, our second speaker. Paul is head of geography at Bethel School in Amshari and had a start in a variety of settings over the past 10 years and takes a particular interest in social and environmental activism. Before leaving the floor to our first speaker, Chiara, I remember you that you can post your questions in the chat box and we will go back to them as more as possible after the presentation. Also, please note that this webinar session is being recorded and the recording will be available after on the webinar webpage on School Education Gateway, to get together with our speakers' presentations. So thank you very much to our speakers, and, uh, and uh, I hand it over to you so you can introduce yourself more in details and start the presentation right away. Hello, everyone. Can you please confirm if you can hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Chiara. Okay. Perfect. Um, um, I'm Chiara, and uh, thank you for the lovely introduction, Ina. And uh, sorry, I didn't understand if the participants would need to introduce themselves first. Uh, you, you, you can go on with the, the presentation. Sorry, I wasn't sure about that. So thank you for joining us. You can. <laughs> and uh, I'm here representing Italian Common Network, and uh, I am about to uh, start my presentation here. Give me just one second. Okay. Um. Yeah, the presentation was already there. Um, I could not move it. That's why I'm trying to understand what is happening with the app that I just installed on my laptop. So sorry. Okay. Um, I think I might expand it. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I will. Otherwise, I'm here to help. Yes, sure. I'm not. There is some kind of problem with. Thank you. Can you see the presentation moving yes. to the the slides moving? Yes. Yeah, just tell me when you need uh, me. You you need me to move to the upcoming slide. So, so I'm I'm here today yeah. representing the Italian Summer Network. And um, I'm here, uh, Italian Climate Network uh, is a, um, a youth-focused uh, organization um, um, focusing on intergenerational equity and youth empowerment. And among, we have an, among other uh, of our activities, our main educational program is the school project. And uh, I would like to show you the next uh, slide, please, if it's possible. Thank you, Inna, and sorry again for this. Um, we, since 2013, we started piloting an educational um, 
an educational in initiative. Uh, we uh, noticed that there was a lack uh, in the educational system in Italy of uh, about uh, um, about uh, uh, climate change uh, and in general environmental education. We started piloting this program, trying to study different techniques on how to approach students that are usually secondary school students between 14 and 18 years old. And uh, in 2013, we finally launched our officially the school project, the Progetto Scuola. Um, among that, um, the Progetto Scuola, in the school project, is not the only educational activity that we have, but we also educate and empower youth through our um, Particip participation to the UNFCCC negotiations uh, at the COPS and also with some uh, international uh, international work. Um, if it's possible to move to the next slide. So, um, and there should be, uh, if you click again, there should be an image appearing. Sorry for that. Thank you. So, um, we're particularly, um, we're particularly proud of this project as we really tried to, as I said, to fill um, a, a gap that there was in the schools. Uh, there is a, what is called a civic education in schools. So that is something is kind of or is a kind of education that should provide general skills to the students in their everyday life. And the, the goal is to make them better citizens. As part of that, we definitely saw that there was a lack, as I said, in climate uh, and uh, environmental education. If we can move to the next slide, thank you. So, and uh, once again, if you click again, um, we have uh, several topics uh, in which we focus. So our lessons, they are not only about explaining what is climate change. Of course, we also do that, but we also focus on different aspects of a phenomenon, a phenomenon that, as you probably know better than me, is quite complex, has different angles and should have an intersectional approach. So we started with some lessons like on climate energy, climate energy and energy. Uh, climate negotiations and other topics first to then uh, in uh, to their starting introduce some more intersectional uh, um, more intersectional um, topics like human rights and uh, health and this is actually something that I would like to stress uh, because it's uh, not an, a traditional approach at least in Italy uh, to speak about environment and climate change the international, uh, the intersectional approach is not used. And how we started uh, um, developing these lessons, we basically um, create uh, um, uh, created a series of presentations. And of course, on the side, we also created uh, and um, a tool for um, our um, relatori that are basically our trained uh, staff that uh, goes to the schools to deliver these lessons. I'm one of the authors of these lessons. I authored the climate and human rights uh, um, lesson, but of course I cannot be present every time to deliver it in schools and we wanted to ensure the maximum quality possible when it came to the delivery of this, uh, of this course. And uh, for this reason, uh, we prepared this presentation, but also on the side, a series of uh, a summary of what it should be the general uh, arch of the topics that should be um, that should be addressed during the lesson, and uh, extra resources, especially if. Uh, um, the, the person delivering the lesson doesn't have the appropriate background uh, um, or specific uh, um, um, or specific studies to support his presentation and then answer the questions of the students. Another thing that we keep in mind is, of course, is to tailor our way of communicating depending on the age. If we have in front of us uh, like a class of 14 years old, we're going probably to focus less on the data and more to make sure um, and we will focus more to have a certain messages pass to have uh, to make sure that they have a certain messages clear like what is exactly climate change or why we can say that uh, um, an event in the weather we cannot connect it directly in climate change to climate change but we have to wait for a certain amount of time we give them basically all the tools 
to understand and navigate the information they can they can find and um, if they are of course older in age we sometimes go more in depth when it comes to data and other details but i can assure you that a 14 year old can really surprise you and sometimes i come with really specific questions if it's possible to move to the next slide it would be fantastic So the reason why it was important for us to move uh, towards an intersectional approach, it is because uh, we need, that is for us is the way forward. There is really not um, a way to um, address climate change in a different way from now on. It's, we don't have time, it's a complex, it's a complex issue and it's really, really important for um, young people to understand the implications of this phenomenon. And that's why we started talking about human rights and health and making them understand how different uh, vulnerable groups are different in effect are differently affected depending on the level of recognition and implementation of the human rights uh, and the level of resilience of the country and uh, the kind of challenges that my um that they might have uh, in their country. And we also stress a really, uh, another really important concept. If we can move to the other slide, thank you. We also really talk about climate justice, and this is a concept that is always and often, well, this was really new before the movement of Fridays for Futures, but, and after that it became definitely more acknowledged from uh, uh, the, the kids. And, uh, uh, but definitely before it was a concept that he wasn't um, familiar with them. So uh, kids were not understanding how basically um, the countries that contributed the most to the emissions that created the problem of climate change are also those that are uh, more resilient and that at the moment, uh, um, are not paying the higher cost. Who is paying the higher cost are those countries that less contributed to the um, to the problem. And we always stress this kind of uh, um, this kind of uh, um, um, of topics. Uh, if we can move to the next slide, please. So yes, um, it's uh, we really stress once again this uh, uh, this concept, uh, and it always raises a lot of interesting questions with the kids. So I'm, if any one of you in your um, in your experience with uh, um, kids in school uh, is uh, worried to bring them uh, um, to know uh, to bring them closer to topics that are actually quite complex and interconnected among that, I would definitely encourage you to not be scared and go for it. Actually, the response uh, that we had so far, it was fantastic. And they, uh, it really raised the interaction of uh, the kids. If we can move to the next slide, please. Uh, once again, thank you. Um, so far, the school project has been uh, um, really positive in our cycle between 2013 and 2020 we reached uh, 45 school 30 cities and 11 regions and the um the feedback has been and the, res the response from the kids has been extremely positive we uh, have now uh, solid relations with uh, with uh, several schools that calls us every year and uh, the teachers are particularly enthusiastic when it comes to the problems that we had with this uh, project i can tell you that in general in italy is difficult to integrate our activities in the uh, in the time that is given to school for extra activities can you still hear me yes i can hear you Apologies, everything went black on my laptop. Sorry for that. I can see you again. Or maybe not. Sorry. Let me just try this. It's one of those days. My apologies. Um, okay, here I am again. Thank you. Um, so as I was saying, um, yes, one of the problems with the Italian schools is to find 
the time to uh, integrate our activities. They don't have the many hours to integrate extracurricular activities. And uh, in general, there is the fact that there is, we are not um, like uh, concentrating the curricula and is actually the kind of gap that we were trying to create. Another problem is also the preparation of the teachers. The teachers that contact us usually are um, teachers that are familiar with the, with the topic and that are really enthusiastic and that they want their, uh, their students to learn more about that, but they are the first ones to recognize that they don't have the preparation to um, give them the right information, especially because these are topics that are so current that there is always there is always the need to be updated on them. And that is something that we can provide. Um, Outside of the school project, we also have other activities. If we can move to the next slide. Thank you, Inna. Oh, yes, we reached more than 8,000 students. Ah, oh, yes, one last thing to mention is the fact that uh, we are also implementing uh, uh, like a monitoring service. So we are sharing now with schools uh, uh, anonymous surveys, both to the teachers and to the students, of course, tailored differently. But that is also, we are really trying to measure our impact. The goal is to see if after our lesson, the teachers observed anything different in the preparation of the students and vice versa the students we ask them if something has changed in their life if they change their behavior at school at home or in general if they feel like they have more awareness of the problem and if they want to do something about climate change in one way or another so yes if you can move uh, to the next slide we can, I can give you a really uh, quick overview of the other act educational activities that we have. Another way in which we empower and educate youth, and in this case, they're usually um, older, um, so it can go from 18 and above. But um, we give the possibility to other associate, I mean, to other the members of the organization to participate in the COPs. They can candidate themselves every year and come with us in a small youth delegation and participate into the COPs. There are the conferences of the parties of the UNFCCC. What we do there, information, we teach them how to write articles videos uh, and uh, with how to deal with so with social media and reporting on what is happening on the co at the, uh, at the cops on uh, the, on the climate negotiations on specific topics that is an amazing experience for them to understand the UN environment how how multilateralism works uh, and how such an important uh, um, issue for the world is addressed uh, in as I said in a in a systemic and uh, multilateral approach. If you can move forward, thank you. Another of the activities that we have uh, at the COP, it's, uh, um, yes, here there are some pictures, sorry. Another activities that we have at the COPs are at the side events, it should be in the in the next slide. So we give the possibilities of the young, to the, to the young people. Yes, this is the kind of information I was mentioning before, the bulletin, we give a uh, technical reports, we teach them how to do it. And yes, here there are the side events. So what we also give them the chance if there is a specific topic that they care about, we give them the tools and the support to organize an event. We have a network of organizations that support us and that we're in contact with and that we collaborate with through the um, through the COPs. We are part of two constituencies. That is something that I'm going to tell you about in a second. And often we have the chance to really um, allow the young people to be there, to interact with these experts and really create an event during this, uh, during the negotiations. If we can move forward. So yes, we do some work across the two constituencies. Constituencies, are, like the constituencies are basically stakeholder groups. It's a space uh, that was provided from the UNFCCC to civil societies observers. Civil society can, of course, do its own work at the COP, advocacy work. They have an observer role. 
And in order to do that, they have to come together because, of course, uh, often there are many small uh, different organizations participating in these events that need to provide the support to one another. The, the process is absolutely massive, it's really difficult to navigate. And this, this is why these spaces were created. So we are part of YANGO, that is the constituency for young people, uh, for organizations, and uh, the women and gender constituencies. These two constituencies, uh, they really focus on several human rights issues and their work is particularly important for interse intersectional approach that we are trying to have in our organization. And once again, uh, this is an interacting with the people from with young people from all, all over the world, different entities understand how this process works. It's a really highly um, professionalizing and educational experience for for young uh, people. If you can move forward, thank you. In addition to the advocacy action events and other things that we do in support to the work within the constituencies, we also have our um, um, our, we try to have a, a dialogue with, of course, the, the Italian delegation and the comps. One of the more important achievements that we had, it was uh, to uh, uh, interact with the um, environmental minister uh, uh, Galletti at the time that assigned a declaration of support uh, where it was basically stating that he would have supported the introduction of the intergenerational equity principle in the Paris Agreement. And it's something that actually happened that you can find now um, the intergenerational equity principle in the preamble of the Paris Agreement. And that was a coordinated action that Italian Common Network contribu contributed in, but it was a coordinated action of several youth uh, organization part of the Yango constituency. So just to give you an idea of how empowering can be being part of these groups during the negotiations. And um, there, there should be another slide. We can move forward. This is this was a general overview. I want to just to uh, I wanted I wanted you to see how our contacts are. Uh, I'm absolutely open for questions. Sorry for the technical issues and thank you for your patience. But this is more or less how our approach to education and how we're trying to empower young people. And if you have any questions, I'm here at your disposal. Thank you. Thank you, Chiara. Thank you very much. I think we can uh, move on with the presentation uh, of a uh, well, and then we will, of course, get back to the questions of our participants. Hello. Hello, um, Paul. Can you tell me if you are great? So you... Yeah, I can. Um, hello. So, yeah, I'm a teacher from the UK. Um, I am head of department, head of geography. Uh, in a school which I'm quite fortunate in that I've got quite a bit of curriculum freedom and have the ability to um, uh, to very much take the, the curriculum and, and what is taught in in a particular direction. Um, one thing I did want to just make a point of is to say today is a particularly um, sort of exceptional day and I think it'd be worth just to mention that all of the events going on partly with coronavirus but it was also um, to do with uh, race in America and across the world, I think it's important to realize that all of those issues are linked and that climate change is part of that and, and part of the solution to climate change is um, uh, actually linked to all of these issues. So I think as a teacher it's important to have that in mind um, as an educator. Um, I wanted to start by giving some context then to this, uh, these resources and the journey that, that we went in. So we've obviously got this sort of iconic figure there of uh, Greta Thunberg there um, on the front cover of, of Time magazine. And she is someone who has become such a figurehead um, in terms of the eloquence and the um, ability um, to communicate these ideas. And then we've also, in the UK, we've had uh, the Extinction Rebellion protests and actions. 
and uh, across the whole of Europe and the rest of the world that's been mirrored we've got the Fridays for Futures and what I wanted to emphasize here is that as a teacher I have felt that the rhetoric uh, just in terms of the media and uh, the general population and society has been um, can I just double check sorry um, can everyone hear me hear the sound there seems to be a few questions there about the sound okay yes, I'm well, sure we... it's fine. sorry um, it must be other people um, so where I was going with that was that actually the rhetoric uh, in the media has been shifting and that has then empowered me as a teacher to feel that I can then um, talk about these issues in a different way and feel empowered to be able to teach differently and so um, off the back of that I then reflected on the way that I was teaching climate change and also engaged with the wider teaching community about how they felt as well so in the UK we've had um, sorts of these sorts of actions where the UK government has been um, there's been certain demands to say look we need to be teaching climate truth or we needed to be we need to teach the future and so there's certainly um, a consensus around the idea that what is currently taught in schools doesn't necessarily reflect what is needed and what's necessary in order to prepare students but also to create the the world that we want to live in and particularly what the, the, the students in the future will want to live in um, this image um, I've got a link here this is something from um, someone called Ed Hawkins at the University of Reading and I'll just post the link in the chat there it's called show your stripes and these are called the warming stripes and this is an important part of the journey because this really helps to visualize um, the science and the fact behind this and that was also an important element of um, what I'll show you in a minute was to begin with the foundation of the science and so it shows this very clear warming trend and you can find these warming stripes for um, particular regions and countries around the world so one thing I would advocate is um, using these within your own setting using these warming stripes um, the other one that's very similar is the Keeling curve which shows you the carbon dioxide concentrations and again um, I'll just post a link to that you know, at the moment we're at just above 416 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere um, and that's been increasing quite considerably um, since pre-industrial and industrial levels so that gives you the context of where we are what kind of world we currently live in um, the other before I move on to the resources I wanted to emphasize there's a real inequality and disparity linked to this as well so um, this is from Oxfam and it, it's uh, sort of almost like a champagne glass and it shows that disproportionately the richest people in the world so the 10 top 10 percent of richest people in the world actually emit the largest or um, almost 50 percent of carbon dioxide emissions and so it's the richest people in the world will have to have the the biggest shift in their lifestyles and actually there's possibly uh, the largest proportion of people in the world that will be able to um, to emit more and I think that's a good context for for the way that you might approach it in schools um, sorry this is then the Keeling curve and it shows you then the, um, the historical uh, cycles from interglacial to glacial and then it gives you the context of where we are now up above 416 parts per million and, and part of this is then to emphasize that urgency and the idea that we we really cannot wait that it, there, there needs to be momentum from educators particularly from a grassroots level and from the bottom up to use their initiative to then bring these issues into the classroom and so one of the things that we then did was think okay let's have a look in the UK at what is currently taught and so at, at the age of 15 16 students um, have, have um, external examinations that they have to take there are explicit schemes of work and I know this is mirrored then in other countries around Europe and so we looked at things like the sciences and um, what we did is, is carried out something of, of a, um, an analysis to score these um, syllabus and work out which of them and, and you can see in this diagram here is actually biology that best addressed the climate and ecological emergency and then closely followed behind with something like geography and it may be that social sciences or something is similar in your context but it was the sciences in particular that were um, addressing these but there was a deficit with all of them that none of them addressed it 
particularly well and that um, of all the subjects there were only maybe three potentially four that actually looked at it um, this then gives you a bit of an idea of the words that we were exploring so things like climate change global warming deforestation and it did show that some subjects were particularly good at including words like carbon dioxide um, or uh, um, things like geography looking at climate change but there was still this massive gap in terms of a lack of this kind of vocabulary in what was expected to be taught and I think it's important that this is a good indicator then of the emphasis that is applied in these in these resources or in these schemes of work and, and in the syllabus and it will direct what teachers do and therefore it means that in the practical sense of the day-to-day -day classroom it may well mean that there's a lack of discussion about climate change because it's simply missing from the, the um, syllabuses um, the other thing we wanted to pick out when we looked at this was we realized that the language um, and the grammar of the way that the uh, content was included was not particularly good and actually it was detrimental so it talked about things like many scientists believe that human activities will cause the temperature and so this idea that there's um, the kind of misrepresentation of the consensus that, that now uh, there is almost 100% of scientific evidence which suggests climate change is man-made or human-induced and that's missing from lots of this. Also this idea that it's um, about future impacts and the idea that actually it's not here and now and so it's important that um, we bring that sense of the here and now. Um, I think there's another one here that um, the, the, this, this was from a chemistry syllabus and it said the problems caused by increased levels of air pollutants require scientists and engineers to develop solutions that help to reduce the impact on human activity and what it was doing is um, inadvertently it's it's prioritizing and emphasizing this idea of a techno fix and possibly that creates the wrong dynamic as well so these are again other problems that we identified within the way that it was already being taught so what we did is we we sort of um, crowdsourced um, about 14 questions that we thought were fundamental um, and then put them together as a um, scheme of work or, or a syllabus and what I'll do is I'll share a link to these resources so these are sort of open source um, uh, and, and I, what I would also say is they're ongoing in the sense that please do if there's something in there that you think could be improved do um, share that as well um, yeah, sorry, here's the link as well. Um, and what I'll do is I'll just spend a few minutes talking through some of what I think are the fundamentals and the key components of this. And the idea is this is to try and um, to sort of inspire you and to enthuse you to then maybe take some of the resources. So the idea is even though, so it's a series of 14 lessons, but they don't have to be taught consecutively. They don't actually have to be taught as a whole lesson. You could take an element of it and 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 I hope you'll also find that, that this is a really good combination of some of the best diagrams and images and, and sort of online resources so it may be that you pull some of those out and use them because also um, as has been sort of spoken before it depends on your context so it may be that you struggle to find the time to be able to fit this in or you cannot you need to be sort of creative almost in order to um, um, uh, include this okay so yeah, what I'd say is we've uh, shared this through lots of social media, you know, and we've had about 5,000 downloads or more than, and, and there's definitely um, a big desire for these sorts of resources. Um, people are keen to include this and to, to have this sort of an inspiration. So fundamentally what underpins this is a, a, a very scientific approach. And the first lesson is all about understanding the current facts. So what is it that scientists understand? And, and clarifying that for students so that then you move from the science to then the more open-ended discussion and thinking about then the societal and, and the broader questions. The, also the idea is to, to really head on challenge a lot of those misconceptions so often students have quite a confused understanding of the mechanics of, of climate change. Um, a good example is maybe this association with ozone and the holes in the ozone layer that people get confused then with the kind of the dynamic with climate change um, and then I would also say there's, there's the idea of open discussion and critical debate that this is not about brainwashing children 
or um, having one particular um, line of argument that you're you're saying students have to believe. And so by opening up these sorts of facts and arguments, you then create in the classroom um, an environment that feels safe for students, that they can then ask questions um, and debate these sorts of ideas. But the other thing as well is um, being open to discussion of system change, and particularly then thinking about capitalism and um, neoliberalism and the idea of the current economic uh, circumstances and situations and the way businesses and politics run. I think in a school, you know, that should be felt like it's an open environment in order to question and to talk about those and what are the alternatives, um, as well as then the urgency um, and, and, and also then bringing in the natural world. So uh, there's a good example linked to that. Um, so these are some examples of some of the questions that lead the lessons. So the lessons have an inquiry approach. It's about the students sort of going and, and finding out this knowledge themselves, having explored certain resources. Um, some of the ones I quite like are, could we plant trees to solve climate change? I know that in the UK, a lot of the media has been pushing this as, oh, it's a silver bullet that we can just plant trees um, to, um, to solve this. Um, also then thinking about population, because often population is then closely linked to this and, and people are saying, well, we need to cap population. Well, is that true? Um, is it maybe more to do with the lifestyle of people? Um, okay. Um, this is a, a one I particularly enjoy. So linking the idea of the natural world, um, this is taking the students outside of the classroom, which again, I think is a fundamental opportunity for this type of learning, is to say, let's, let's put students in um, an alternative setting. So they might often just stay in a classroom, but take them outside. And then this is a very simple activity to measure the height of a tree and then also its circumference. And then using some quite simple maths, and again, that's bringing in another skill, developing some math skills to then work out how much uh, carbon is locked away in that tree. And then you can use that to, to calculate how many trees would I need to plant to then offset my carbon emissions in a year. And then you can scale it up to another country or, or to the world. And you start to realize, or students then realize, well, actually, are there certain limitations to this? That how quickly will we run out of land in order to plant new trees that ultimately need maybe 100 years to grow to their full height anyway? Um, this is another one then comparing uh, countries. And, and this activity gets students to explore um, the numbers. So the idea is this is, is sort of incorporates really up to date key statistics. And then um, students can explore. This is again a bit of a misconceptions one because often, particularly between China and the USA, students get confused which is the, the largest polluter, which one emits the most carbon dioxide. And, and then that relationship between population and is it, um, does it depend on the number of people you've got or the, the um, the, um, the the type of economy. So there's there's some really interesting um, threads that can be explored through that. This is another really good um, interactive resource, and and within these materials, there's quite a few linked like this. And this is a live feed of energy data from countries across the world, and it allows you to look at the carbon intensity as well as the amount of energy that countries are, are um, emitting. And so. Uh, again, it's about bringing students this up-to-date current knowledge and, and also in a kind of interesting um, and interactive sense as well. Um, one of the other things we did was we set up something called an ignorance test. And, and this was almost inspired by the Gapminder Foundation and the Factfulness book where they have their own um, Factfulness or Gapminder ignorance test. And this had uh, 20 questions that were multiple choice. And I'll quickly link it this in um, into the chat so that you can see this. And what I'm just going to do is highlight some of the questions that I thought were particularly interesting. And this has had now, um, is it maybe, so there's the link, climate change ignorance test. I think it's had more than one and a half. Yeah, 1,678 people have responded to this. Average score 13, 13 and a half out of 20. I think that that's pretty good. I would say that, that climate change potentially is one of those issues that people have just through the media picks up a pretty good understanding. But what it is, is there are some of those finer details that are actually fundamental to solving this and to, to really getting to grips with it that, that, that we need to work on. Um, this is also an interesting one that you could challenge your whole school community. 
um, and we we've done that we've uh, we, we um, sent it out to all our parents to all the staff and then it was something that students were talking with the head teacher and with their parents you know what score did you get what did you think about this question and that in itself led to lots of really interesting discussions um, so here's an example of some of the questions climate change has only occurred in the last 140 years what that one does is it really gets you to think about the semantics so this language of climate change are we talking about um, anthropogenic or human induced climate change or are we talking about what's been going on over um, you know, hundreds of thousands of years um, how many deaths attributed to climate change again yeah well potentially is it underreported you know where does that number come from um, but, but the idea is the scale of difference there is it 1500 or is it 150,000 gets people to, to think about the scale of the problem the 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 true figure at the moment is 150,000 but I would I would bet to say that that's an underrepresentation um uh, we've got the what percentage of scientific evidence you know is it 50 50 because often still in um in the media climate change is presented as one of those oh we need to give a balanced argument well the reality is the scientific evidence 98 percent or even now maybe a hundred percent of scientific evidence suggests that climate change is human induced and therefore why have it as a balanced argument you don't need someone who's a climate skeptic because that would be a disproportionate that would be an imbalance of the argument um now you've then got this link with maybe air quality and thinking about um, environmental problems um, in the UK 40,000 people die prematurely due to poor air quality people often um, you know, don't understand that scale they often under uh, kind of under um, estimate it and then that last one each day the world burns 100 million barrels of oil it's true and again it's something that people just don't think about the, the, to do with the lifestyle and consumption um, just such a high figure okay so that's a really interesting one that then was an opportunity to engage students in the wider community um, thinking a bit more crea creatively again this idea of connecting students with nature we've got them one of the lessons takes the students outside and then they perform some poetry they read some poems and then that gets them to reflect so the idea is to think about their relationship with nature and, and how much space we give for nature is part of this as well so i guess it goes a bit broader than just uh, climate change um, ultimately though it culminates in a debate um, again quite a controlled situation and um, the the scheme of work sets it up so that students take particular perspectives so you kind of go from a spectrum of being climate skeptic to maybe someone who's more neutral or undecided and then you've got the more radical activist at the other end and the idea is students then debate this of um, the, the motion that we use is this house believes radical action is needed to tackle irreversible climate change and there's lots in that you know that wording of irreversible the idea of radical action there's lots there that students can discuss and the, the idea is that um, they take the knowledge they've learned from that scheme of work and, and it culminates in in that sort of debate um, so just then just to finish off there's to support these materials what we did is we recorded some videos that help explain some of the kind of meta um explanation and the reasoning behind the activities and how to implement them properly so there's a whole youtube playlist linked to this with with um kind of how to's almost so the idea is that these lessons can be picked up by anyone and, and kind of quickly um, understood um we also try to engage parents because what i would say is that i see the school environment as an opportunity to engage with a much bigger community so we set up an evening where parents were invited in and then we gave them a taster of some of the lessons that we um, we give to the students so they had a go at some of the activities and it was an opportunity to um to challenge their perception of what school is like and hopefully try and expose them to some of the more innovative and creative activities but also to update their climate change knowledge so i think often it's the parents who who um, are lacking there's a bit of a gap in in terms of their knowledge um, so here's an example of how we use the warming stripes we've sort of put them as a banner across the back of the classroom and the idea is then that they're always present these are for the uk and it goes from 1850 to the present day um, so there's lots of opportunities to be able to use the sort of imagery um, and the graphs just within the classroom environment and within the educational setting. Um, this is um, 
uh, kind of a collation of lots of resources. So there is also, you know, what I would say is there's lots of really good stuff. Particularly, there's some books that this scheme of work was based on that would be useful for anyone to read or for, to encourage students to read. And particularly, there's that one there. It's called There Is No Planet B. Um, and yes, I wanted to just finish with that graph just to emphasize the urgency and to say, look, we are in such unprecedented and uh, different times. And therefore, we should feel this sort of need to... to um, to be as radical and, and um, kind of to bring the change to our classroom as much as possible. So yes, sorry, there was one last quote to finish with. It's this statement that you know, if teachers were teaching climate change right, would we be in the situation we're in at the moment? And though um, education and teachers can't solve every problem, they're an important part of that. And I think it's important for students, uh, for teachers, sorry, to realise that. So for teachers to understand the, the position they're in and to realise that they, they really need to communicate the urgency, discuss the potential of system change and encourage an imagination and a positive future so that students understand how they can make the world, but also themselves, happier and healthier. So fundamentally to this scheme of work is the idea that we can both improve the health of the planet but also ourselves and I think that's where I finish yes thank you very much Paul. thank you very much I would like to give some uh, minutes to our participants to write down any other question they might have for either for you or for Chiara but uh, somebody already asked how do the parents respond were they really involved it was a question for paul the, the parents were really um, positive and they appreciated themselves that they didn't know the up-to-date knowledge and they were really keen to come in and just to have that update of, of what is the current science what do we currently know and what is it that you're teaching my child i think also what came through is that lots of the activities um, encourage students to engage in conversation with their parents or with their other people um, and, and that was something that, that came through across the whole scheme of work was that um, they were then having conversations much broader. Um, it's perhaps uh, something that uh, personally I would like to know uh, um, if this is, uh, this is something that also Chiara might want to uh, to reply to um, the same question about how uh, the parents responded uh, to the um, uh, project uh, uh, you were involved uh, into with the Italian climate change. Yeah. Um... We had only positive feedback. We don't have um, direct interactions with the, the parents because we deliver these lessons directly in school. So we deal mainly with teachers. But of course, the activities are coordinated with the families and they are aware that the, uh, they are receiving these lessons. And again, the feedback that we had so far was only positive and actually um, especially after uh, the attention that Fridays for Future received, uh, there is uh, an even more urgent request from uh, uh, parents, schools and teachers to receive, to have uh, the tools uh, and receive the kind and provide the kind of education that, um, that, uh, that the kids need on, on these topics. So absolutely positive, yes. And uh, at the beginning of your presentation, we had a, a participant asking you more of a practical question. So how my school can participate in, in your project? Is it an Italian student? And is the question for me, I'm assuming. So I'm just... Yes. Thank um, you. The, 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 um, um, if that is a student uh, that is asking a question, it may, the student might talk with one of their teachers and coordinate a request. They just need to write to the email that was at the end of my um, presentation. 
the Tisa Scholar at Italia Clima Talk, but I'm going as soon as my laptop comes back to normal, I'll make sure to provide you that contact. And then we move forward from there, taking agreements uh, directly with the school on the time that is available and the kind of lesson that you would prefer to um, to provide, to be provided. And uh, we make sure to come to your school and, uh, and we deliver the lesson. And uh, the same applies for teachers. If a teacher wants to provide this kind of uh, uh, knowledge to their students, they can contact us directly and we move, uh, we move from there. Yes, yeah, we are for everybody who were um, asking that question. Here, uh, here is a slide with the Italian Clarin Network contact. Um, I'm just checking the chat box to see if we have more questions coming in. For both of you. And uh, I, just a second, <laughs> there are so many uh, participants right now that my chat box has freezed, but uh, um, um, in the meantime, I, w I would like to uh, ask you to a question. I would really like to understand um, if you, uh, in, in both of your experiences, uh, uh, how did you perceive the, the, the change in the initial uh, attitude of the kids, the students you, you're, working, you're working with, and how their attitude uh, uh, is changing uh, after? I'm happy to go first. Um, yeah, thank you, Paul. I, I think that what I've experienced teaching this is that students often think they already know it all, that, that um, climate change is something that is discussed so frequently and is on uh, in the news so much now that, that they almost feel overwhelmed or that all the conversation has already been had or they often, which is also the slightly scary response, is they feel powerless and that they almost feel resigned to a fate. And what I found is teaching in this way actually gives them much more hope and that it um, what it does is it, it gives them the knowledge and the skills and the ability to think a bit more critically and to to feel empowered to then have that hope so that's been a big difference for me um, I had the summer uh, following up uh, on what Rob just said um, yes so we we found uh, something similar at times, depending on the kind of school and the, the kind of students crowd that we were having. But, and yes, also in our experience in Italy, we can say that there are um, students really expressing their feelings, uh, where like, this is too big, what can I do with my small actions uh, and so on. And especially what they tend to ask is also, what can I study? What can I do? What, are the, what is the path that I can follow to contribute in some way uh, to solving this problem? So we always explain that it's important to have uh, some personal changes in the, the personal lifestyle, of course, but that is not the only thing that, that they, they should do and is not enough in general, that a systemic change is needed. And if that is what they want to achieve and they want to contribute to that. Actually, there is so much that can be done around climate change. Uh, we, especially we stress, uh, what, we, what we stress especially is the fact that they don't um, need to necessarily become an engineer or to um, go toward a scientific path to 
contribute to the fight against climate change, but they can work in, in, um, in education, communication, information. They, we always stress our activities at the COP, so advocacy, civil society engagement. And we also stress that there is a lot that can be done also at um, the local level in their communities, so they can contribute also toward that. And we always stress that in the mo that usually politicians so that are those that take the decisions tends to make uh, their political agenda you know to put in their agenda as a top of priority something that they think uh, people cares about so it's important for we encourage them to be active citizens to inform themselves to be interested also in politics in, also in order to um, to shape their own uh, ideas of course and have an impact uh, in the um, in the in their in their own communities and uh, and beyond if they have uh, any desire of going towards an international career and we always bring uh, our team uh, uh, as an example as we in Italian Climate Network we are a group of people with the most different backgrounds uh, and we are a good example of what uh, can be done from young people and this tends to lift their spirits uh, and let them know that there are solutions there uh, we need to just push forward on that. Thank you very much. I think there was just uh, one last question and uh, um, Maybe this for Chiara. Um, are guidelines provided by the United Nations under education for sustainable uh, development uh, useful in developing curricula to teach about climate change? That is actually a really good question. We didn't take the UN approach in the sense that we, of course, talk also about the sustainable development goals in our lessons, but we didn't take necessary um, the kind of, you know, communication that they have, but we do teach, of course, the intersectionality and the intercorrelation that there are between all these topics, as I stressed several times during the presentation. This is also a particular question as um, Italy, um, there was an announcement last year about Italy becoming the first country in the world to integrate permanently um, some uh, sustainable development uh, um, education in their curriculum. So, um, and that was uh, announced by uh, our minister Fioramonti. And uh, Fioramonti wanted to really to replicate the SDGs uh, structure. He really wanted to use the UN uh, um, approach. Um, but unfortunately, in the meantime, there has been a change of government and there has been the COVID uh, um, situation. So we don't have news on how this initiative is moving forward. But it's something that, of course, we would welcome as Italian Climate Network uh, is uh, delivering this educational project, as I said before, to fill uh, a gap that we do hope is not going to exist anymore in uh, Italian schools uh, and educational programs.